Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Kristen, ASA's health and wellness exec, if you haven't met me yet. Uh, welcome to our May health and wellness module. Um, as many of you guys know, May is mental health month, and we're closing it out with Matt and Alex from MindBuffs. If you've tuned into the wellness panel at the recent Edmonton Direct, you'll have heard them introduce the topic of self-awareness and how emotions can translate into bodily symptoms. So awareness and recognition are the first steps to improving our own mental health. So today they'll be expanding on those topics and concepts and strategies we can use in our own lives. So we love questions as well as always. Feel free to type them into the chat anytime. Uh, we'll be answering them as we go and at the end as well, so stay tuned. And I'll leave it to Matt and Alex to introduce themselves further if they need and take it away with the presentation. Thank you. Hello, hello, hello. So this morning, yes, just like Kristen said, we're going to touch and expand a bit more on the concept that we were going over um, at the Edmonton Direct. Um, so if you were curious and and uh, and present during that um, to kind of hear more information, more in depth, maybe the, even the science behind, you know, why it is our brain does um, some of these things, then that's what you're gonna uh, be getting today. Um, but just as a brief intro, in case you haven't seen uh, myself, and then I'll, I'll let Alex introduce herself. Um, my name is Matt Demosak. I'm a sport and performance psychologist, um, co-founder at MindBuffs. Um, I have an extensive background in playing um, competitive sports, uh, coaching competitive sports, and have been an avid gamer my entire life. I'm currently um, playing a lot of Rocket League and Apex. Um, I find that they are really similar to a lot of the sports I played growing up, where there's both the that competitive feeling and also like the team um, strategy mindset. Uh, so I've been doing that uh, a lot lately. And uh, so yeah, this is gonna be module one of three. We're gonna touch on the body, on thoughts, on feelings, and today's gonna be about body. And I'll just send it off to Alex for her to introduce herself. Hi everyone, I'm Alex. And uh, exactly like Matt said, I'm a sport and performance psychologist at MindBuffs as well as Matt's other side of the co-ownership. And um, again, like Matt said, I have an extensive background in, um, in sports and competitive sports. I recently bought a Nintendo Switch, so I'm joining the gaming world. I've tried, mm -hmm. I'm, aw I'm awful, but I will continue <laughs> to get better. <laughs> um, and I'm having a lot of fun on it. So uh, like I said, any tips or tricks, I'm open to it. So feel free to send us some stuff. Um, and then this is, uh, I'll let Matt kind of take this one away. Yeah, so I, I'll be doing more of a speaking than, than we usually do when Alex and I are on. This is kind of a, a project that I've um, been doing quite a lot uh, this year. And so Alex will will be able to come in and out and supplement um, some of the things we're going to be talking about. Uh, and just like Christian had said earlier, just flood the chat with questions. I love answering questions live. I love right in the moment being able to answer someone's curiosity or someone's confusion, uh, or if some of you really feel, feel comfortable about sharing some of your own personal experiences, as you kind of hear some of the things that we're gonna be talking about, um, I'd love um, for you to, to share those things. And at around the halfway point, uh, there'll be a shift from kind of like psychoeducation to more um, like personal experience, like opportunity to kind of reflect on personal experience. Um, and I'll be asking specific questions to um, to you guys who are in the audience and um, to my two panel mates today. Uh, so again, feel free to to uh, be as active as you want uh, this morning. So the focus is on self awareness and just this little um, quote on the bottom: If you can't connect with yourself first, struggle is going to be real. Um, it can be really difficult to know what you need who you need to talk to, how to connect with other people. If you're not aware of your personality, your strengths and weaknesses, what are the thoughts going between the ears? How are you feeling? What messages are your body sending you? It is such an extensive list of things that over the course of our lifetime, um, it's important that we learn these things about ourselves because it'll help us be able to perform better in life, in gaming, in work, in relationships. And so these modules that we're gonna be doing over the spring and summer are going to be specific ways in which um, each one of you can learn a little bit more about yourself so that you have a few extra tools uh, in your kit as you uh, continue to kick ass in life. So this is the, the summary, okay? So if you're ready to learn, there's gonna be a lot of learning here in the first 30 minutes. 
Um, I'm a huge Simpsons fan, so any knowledge that you guys um, will see for me, there's going to be at least a few Simpsons references. Um, I, it also ages myself, I guess, being in my mid-30s, but um, uh, the first thing that we're going to be talking about today is going to be about the brain. Um, talking about personality for a sec, there's a lot of people who just need to know, like, how. Just tell me how it works um, and tell me what to do and I'll do it. But then there's all of you why people out there, like me, I'm a big questioner. I just need to know information. And so I, I want to be able to provide for those why people, like as much of the information as I can, because oftentimes it's easier to learn when you when you have that kind of background. So we'll be talking about, you know, the brain, its dominant function, its secondary function, and, um, and then core beliefs. And uh, that's Alex is going to chime in a lot more um, when we talk about that section. And then the second part here, uh, the title of our presentation here is somatic semantics, uh, in case you guys didn't know what the word somatic meant. Somatic is another word for physiological, the, the sensations in which we experience in our bodies. And so um, that's why we've titled it that way today, because uh, semantics is also kind of like the meaning behind a word, the meaning behind language. Uh, and we're going to be talking about six specific sensations that we experience in our body that we all can experience, um, obviously some more than others, depending on their lived experience. And you're going to learn why you feel that. It's not random. We don't just get random um, sensations strewn about in our body. Our nervous system just and just randomly be like, I'm going to send messages to the pinky toe. Oh, time for the left earlobe. It is very specific and consistent. And so we're going to learn about that today. Okay. The brain. Why does it do so many of the things that many of us are frustrated that it does? Um, even for some of you, maybe even internalizing, you know, why do I always feel this way? What is wrong with me? Why is it so different for me than other people? I really want to be able to externalize a lot of those thoughts and feelings for you to understand that it's a brain thing. It's what the brain is supposed to do most of the time. Now, yeah, it'll send false reads sometimes, but it's still operating under a very um, like systematic approach to how it takes in information and engages in communicating to you, the human, of what to do with all of that information that's happening all of the time. And so we're gonna talk about a concept here called the default mode network. Some of you may I've heard um, more of a colloquial term called the reptilian brain. Um, it's more of the, the oldest parts of the human brain looking at uh, back at evolution, that kind of the hind brain and the mid brain are some of the older parts of the brain. And because of that, uh, they are where our sense of survival is kind of housed. Um, thinking back um, during the bulk of human history, um, we weren't always at the top of so we needed to be on our toes all of the time to make sure that we could get through the day, get food, care for the family, and not get eaten by some of the larger um, things that were, you know, roaming around the earth. And so our brain better be a good at being able to protect us and detect any threats that there might be. Now, knowing that the biggest threat that most of us probably face are um, haters over social media, we don't really have... Uh, a lot of need to be checking in every single moment of the day in terms of our physical safety. So this part of our brain is it's much more responsible for our emotional safety now. If we feel any emotional threat, if there's a person in the room, a coworker, a student, um, if if we're bullied, um, obviously we can still get bullied physically, which is which is awful. But even that sense of like, is someone going to make a comment? Like, am I going to get? Um, is my family going to, going to to make side comments about me because of my grades or because I didn't perform well in, in my sport or, um, you know, in, my, uh, in other areas that I perform? Um, and so this part of the brain is always looking out for information to make sure that we are okay. And one of the ways that it does that is by bringing in information from our past to remind us, hey, remember when this happened and it was really freaking awful? Well, here you go. This is important so that you don't make this mistake or be in this situation again. So we get a lot of information from the past. And I know a lot of you get this. What if scenarios in our future? Disaster planning. What is the worst possible thing 
that could happen if I were to open my, out, my mouth right now and say what's going on in here. And a lot of the times we don't because there's a what if scenario that is strong enough, that, is, that presents enough fear that we decide, okay, I, I don't think I'm going to actually like speak up in this meeting or in front of my peers. Um, our brain is in a sense providing a false reading of a threat that has not yet even happened and telling us, hey, maybe it's just better if you just like stay safe, be invisible, fight, flight, freeze mode, do nothing. Um, and that way, hey, no risk, can't get hurt. The brain is doing brain things. It's trying to protect us, okay? So it's really important to understand that that is the dominant function of the human brain. Secondary function, effectiveness and efficiency. Especially during our informative years, the brain is taking in so much information. By the time we're 12 years old, our brain is creating the most amount of neurons um, and, and links in our brain in those 12 years. It's just taking in everything that's happening. That's why when Alex and I work um, with athletes, with anyone at performance, just anyone, everyone, most of our negative core beliefs, which we're gonna talk about in a moment, that um, are a strong part of our internal narrative are actually built from those informative years when we're a child, almost in those pre-adolescent years. Um, because we're just taking in so much information and our brain is trying to establish meaning. Okay, I'm gonna use that word a lot um, going forward here, meaning. So the reason why we can look at objects and we just, I can look around my office right now and in like a split second, I can name like 20 different things that I see in the room. My brain just has this filter of like, hey, I know everything that's in this space. I know the name, I know the color, I know the texture. I know like even what it smells like when the computer starts running hot, like all of these things. I don't need to think about it. The brain has that information ready. It's always there. In that same way, when it comes to some of the negative experiences we've had, or maybe some of the experiences that we've internalized as being negative, our brain established a sense of meaning in that moment and went, okay, what's important about this? And do we need to know this for later? And that's where a lot of our core beliefs come from. Oh, we didn't feel safe here, or we failed here. I felt really trapped here. I didn't feel like I had a voice here. No one was listening to me here. And so it encodes that moment, stores it away. And any other moment in the future that looked the same, that smelt the same, that tasted the same, that felt the same, the brain goes, I know what's going on here. Okay, I'm going to put that in the not safe place, in the not good enough place, in the I'm trapped place. It is the brain simply storing information in an effective and efficient way. And part of this three module series, um, why it's it's going to be um, really important uh, for, for those of you who are, who are, um, are here listening and, and looking forward to the next sessions, you're gonna learn as we progress through this these modules, how you can kind of hijack that system. That even if you are in a situation where there is a threat or you've had a traumatic experience, there are very specific things that we can do in that moment so that our brain doesn't automatically establish a highly negative meaning to that experience and that we can process through those that experience in the moment so that we are not continuing to store these negative um, stressful situations where the brain is constantly presenting us with this information in similar environments and so we're going to be building up to a point where we talk about how um, how we can do that So now we're going to get into core beliefs. Um, on this page here, I have a very sciencey explanation as to what um, a belief is. Um, it was uh, a study that I read um, actually just last year that was looking at how the brain stores information based on beliefs. Uh, and so this was the statement that, uh, that they had written. Beliefs are the neuropsychic product of a fundamental brain process that attributes effective meaning to concrete objects, events, enabling individual goal setting, decision making and maneuvering in the environment, right? So it talks about how it establishes meaning so that when we try to, you know, perform in life, we can do it more effectively, more efficiently. And so that's how um, the, um, the research community has defined beliefs. But in simple terms, the brain at all times is like, 
What just happened? Why does this matter? Are we safe? Are we safe? I think we're safe. I don't know. Are we safe? What do we need to know for next time based on this experience? That's kind of what the brain is doing at all times. Um, and based on the experiences that we have um, individually or uniquely had, um, we get these systems that are built. I'm going to jump in here. Um, with the core beliefs, and I know Matt had already alluded to it in the slide before, but they are oftentimes reinforced over time, like Matt was saying, where uh, the I'm not good enough story comes up and, you know, it maybe you don't do well on a spelling test at age seven and then something happens with friends and maybe you feel like discluded and then it all goes into that box. And then I, our brains are so greatly efficient, but sometimes not in the best way. And so, like Matt's saying, it automatically goes to those core beliefs that we have that are oftentimes reinforced over time based on our experiences. So I think it's, again, we're going to talk more about this stuff and core beliefs is a lot, is ingrained, I would say, in the work that Matt and I do as psychologists is helping um, kind of reroute, hijack those systems like Matt was saying, but yeah. it's also important to understand. And I definitely want to build on that. Thanks for, for chiming in, Alex. Um, a really common um, kind of mental health um, battle that people have is like social anxiety. And social anxiety is a culmination of exactly what Alex had just said. It might start with a simple moment in school. It, it's probably 99% of the time where people learn um, and experience social anxiety. I spoke up in class, it didn't go very well. Or I had a teacher ask me to public speak and it was one of the worst, most awful emotional experiences of my life. If that happens, a few more times over a lifetime, our brain will be so efficient that it'll see a human being and be like, you scary. People that I know that have like agoraphobia that don't want to leave their house, it's because their worst case scenario, seeing a human, then I might have to speak. What if I say something stupid? And then they, they think something really strange about me. That is the effectiveness and at the same time, the inefficiency <laughs> of that system. I actually have a personal story about this. It's going to okay. sound really sad, but when I was in elementary school, I planned a birthday party for myself and no one showed up. Oh. And then ever since then, since elementary, I've just been like anxious on my own birthday. I haven't like held any like birthday parties or anything like that, even no. though, yes, I have friends. I know that. Yeah. And then a couple of years ago, like I actually sat down and I was like, I do have friends. I think I think they would like to hang out with me on my birthday and then I actually had a birthday party and then all my all my beliefs were challenged that day and dispelled Beautiful. but it was still like a very anxious day for me but yeah yes that's really cool but uh you're like wait a second here do I need this anymore is this helpful is this useful for me anymore I don't think so I call bullshit right I yeah <laughs> Yes, and Victor was there too. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that's like perfect example of, of what we're talking about and why today is important um, because we'll be able to hopefully recognize sooner that when we're in these systems for years that we can be able to understand like how our brain is communicating these threats to us because uh, oftentimes we're, we're unaware that our body is doing these things. Uh, and so... Um, like that story that Kristen had, had just shared, like maybe we have very similar stories and maybe our story is, is quite a few years shorter and maybe we can cut it off before it gets to the point where it's been several years where our brain has just, just been doing these things automatically and kind of creating unnecessary stress on really like great days, like a birthday. Um, but yeah, perfect example. So thanks for sharing. No problem. Thanks for listening. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so this is a, a list of, uh, in Alex and I's experience, uh, the most common core beliefs that we have seen in the clinical setting. And again, and this is all walks of life. We've worked with kiddos under 10, work with high competitive athletes in their teen years, 20, 30, 40, 50. I've got a couple of six-year-old clients um, who were going through events that occurred when they were teenagers. And those events are still playing a role in their life where their brain is doing some of these automatic things. And it's because of these core beliefs that they're still running um, at, at such an automatic level without that 
uh, a strong enough awareness where we can kind of rejig, rewire those experiences. And so these are the things that we've kind of seen more often in our practice. Um, I have it in this order because this is the order that I'm going to be kind of showing the slides specifically about each one of these things. And, and, and that's all it is. I need to be in control or I have no control. Um, really common for um, people who perhaps grew in homes that felt like they didn't have as much freedom as maybe they should have. And uh, at the same time, a lot of experiences in, in school, um, we can feel this way as well. And uh, it's where the brain, when it feels like, uh oh, I don't have the control that I want, it starts to go into like over planning mode. And it tries to create plans from A to Z about how to navigate the world because we have to be, um, we have to have a plan for every possible scenario that might happen because we need to make sure that we have as much control because then that guarantees, let's say, our safety or our success or whatever connection that you know our brain has made over the years. Um, I'm not safe. We've all experienced this. I'm not safe physically. I'm not safe emotionally. I'm not safe to be me. It's not safe to speak up. Um, safety, again, because it's the dominant function of the human brain, we're getting are we safe or not reads almost daily. So this is something that we've all experienced, but have we internalized this type of belief to a point where it is almost like a permanent filter through which we are looking through the world? And that is not necessary um, the vast majority of the time. And so we'll talk a bit about that. The I'm not good enough. Yeah, we've all had those. Didn't do well in school, um, had a relationship that didn't end up going well, felt incompetent, had a new job, um, missed an open net shot or didn't clutch at the end of a game when, you know, we needed that win to go on to the next round. Um, yeah, we're going to feel like a failure and not good enough. Um, now, it's okay to fail. It's okay to make mistakes. But are we internalizing those things as I am a failure? I am not good enough. And that's where we want to be able to make that distinction. I'm a burden, I'm responsible. I know this one really well. Um, over the course of my life, I'd probably say that I'm a burden has probably been the strongest negative core belief that I have um, had to work through. Um, grew up in a home with a lot of mental health and I was kind of like the only one that had their crap together. And so I felt like I should never bring up stress that I experience or you know the issues that I'm going on that are happening in my life are so, um, like minor compared to those of the people around me. So like, I, I need to just buck up. There's, I shouldn't have to talk to someone about these things because, you know, other people have it far worse. Um, and so I didn't want to burden people with, you know, my own personal story. Um, and, and because of that, that kind of followed me into my twenties and, and wasn't really until like my thirties where I was like actively tackling, um, and, you know, making a decision that like, I don't need this anymore. And so that one I'm pretty familiar with. And the old I'm trapped one. And I think we've all felt trapped in class or in a horribly boring meeting. Um, some of us would have felt trapped at a more, more dangerous level. Um, and that's uh, also something that, I guess as a warning, as we go through these things, you know, memories are gonna come up, events are gonna, going to come up. Um, but just remember that you're safe now and that if you have moments or memories where you felt trapped as we talk about some of these things that um yeah that you're safe here and and we're here to, to kind of dialogue these things to normalize that hey you know you're probably not the only one that's felt that way um and so that's kind of what we'll, we'll end on is talking about that one all right so we before we dive into kind of like the second half here i just want to share uh, my favorite quote um, on the planet um C.S. Lewis um, is an author that I really enjoy. Um, and this quote is something that I came across in my early 20s when I was kind of finishing my undergrad in, in psych and thinking about what I wanted to do with my, with my career. And it really resonated with me because it just reminded me of all of my years playing as an athlete. You know, that game where before I even got to the rink, it felt like a bag of crap, was thinking about mistakes I'd made the previous game or a conversation I had had with a girlfriend that didn't go well and I was just feeling really crappy. And if I brought those feelings with me into performance, yeah, didn't play very well. But I can think of games when I was like nine years old and 12 years old 
Um, the last game I played when I was 17 years old, I can think of these specific games where like, I just had this sense of belief that like, I was a badass. Like, I was more than good enough. I was worth it. And I carried that belief with me. And I was just in flow state in the zone the whole time. Nothing and no one was stopping me. And that only was able to happen because I brought the right set of beliefs with me to the rink. And especially as, as us gamers, like, are we going in and queuing to the next game, next game, next game, next game, next game? Are we taking a breath? Are we taking a moment to check inside to see what narrative is fueling us, is motivating us to play that next game? Are we taking a confident a confidence builder from a win from the game before? Or are we five, six games into a tilt fest where nothing's going our way, but we just grinding away, hitting that Q button to play the next game? That's not going to go very well. And so can we be able to like take a breath, sit back and go, what's driving me right now? Is it anger? Is it fear of failure? Is it the feeling that if I just have one good game that I won't feel really crappy? Check in and see what you're bringing with you into the game. Right? That's another big thing of, of why I love this, this quote and what we're going to be touching on here in the second half here. Now, I could spend a whole hour talking about this slide. Um, we were talking with uh, Shadow Misstep, Tina, and she, was, she used the term like a pain scale. And this is something that Alex and I are seeing is a, kind of a, a concern with a lot of the people that we're work, working with. Of all the good that social media has been doing the past few years in terms of normalizing mental health, it's also given really big words that probably do not apply to every situation that we experience. I think a lot of us use the words anxious, depressed, when maybe it's just sadness, maybe it's just stress, maybe it's just uncomfortability. And so it's important that we're using the right language because if we apply the term anxious or like depressed to a situation, we've decided that we're wrapping it up to like a seven, eight or a nine out of 10. Maybe it wasn't that big. Maybe we didn't need to do that. Maybe we just don't have an understanding of like what we are experiencing to use the appropriate language so that we can use tools. Because we can't use tools once we're like after seven or eight out of 10 of like stress. That's like survival mode. Just get through whatever you're trying to get through in that moment. But if we're using more appropriate language of like, I'm uncomfortable in my tummy. I do not like this, but I know why I'm uncomfortable in my tummy. But if we're just straight going like, I'm so anxious right now, your brain's like, okay, then dials it up. We may not need to do that every single time. And so we want to be able to be like, okay, am I just uncomfortable? Am I stressed because I'm going through like a huge transition? Like Alex and I opened up an office almost a month ago today. And my wife is graduating from grad school in like two weeks. And I'm the dummy who decided to like start a business at the same time as that. So things were really stressful. But my wife and I knew they were going to be stressful. So every day we were kind of carrying this stress because it was stress of transition, stress of newness, stress of big important things that were coming. Of course we were going to be stressed. So we accept, accepted that we were going to be probably between a three and a five out of 10 for a lot of days in a row, but that was our normal. We knew that that was what was safe to expect. And so we could work within those means. But if we didn't have that conversation, if we didn't have this awareness that when all of these things happen, our body is going to go through a stressful time, then it could have been a thousand times worse than it was. You know, we're getting through it. Every day is getting easier, even though she's graduating in two weeks. We're managing it better because we've accepted that, yeah, this is how our bodies are going to feel. What can we do in those moments to manage it? And so we don't want to always get to the point where we're this psychotic bunny who just feels like life is the worst thing ever, okay? So um, this little comment I have on the top right, um, don't worry um, about that uh, for today. It's it's how I've kind of interacted with, with audiences before, but just straight up put in the chat if you've got any questions or, or things that you wanna ask. Okay, before I jump in, is there anything you wanted to touch on, Alex, or? Uh, just on this last slide, I think we'll probably dive more into this one in module three. Yes, the good. very much so. Uh, if you're interested to learn more, it will be in the third one. So, yeah. Uh, but other than that, nope. Okay. Sweet. 
Okay. Um, I had this for the first time in my life, like a month ago. Um, before this, this wasn't something that I really experienced and I really got headaches. And then I got a tension headache and went, this sucks. Do people get this often? That's not fun. Tension headache is from the outside, you look fine, but inside everything is not fine. It's because the brain's going a million miles a minute trying to think of a way out or come up with a plan or find a solution or be able to create like safety and stability in your environment because you feel like you are you only have this much control of your environment. Oftentimes people who experience a lot of headaches, it's because they are people who experience a sense of, I don't have as much control as I feel like I should have in this situation. So I need to over plan to match that lack of control when that's not possible, A, and it just creates unnecessary stress and to the point where we've got steam blowing out of our ears because someone sent us a text or made a comment on social media that we didn't like, that's out of our control. And we're sitting there being like, oh, they're gonna think this and other people are gonna see this and all of these things that are out of our control. A lot of the times this is experienced in the head, right? So again, I, I want you guys to think um, again in the chat and for those of you like in the panel, are you someone that experiences tension headaches? And if so, what are the environments that you experience them? Or who are the people that you're around where they just tend to keep coming up? There's probably information to which we can draw correlations to which we can kind of see a cause and effect. Every time I'm doing this, or every time I'm in this place, or every time I'm around this person, for some reason, I get these headaches. And so this is kind of like the formula that we're going to be using going through like the next few slides, it's that same system, but for the very specific like sensations in our body. Um, this is probably the one that I've noticed people experience the least, which is why I'm not like throwing it straight to the audience right now. The next slides I will. But uh, again, if this is something that you're like, yeah, I do have headaches all the time and I could, I never figured out why. Maybe it's just your brain trying to tell you um, something very specific. So don't give that a thought. And, and again, if you think about it even later, feel free to put it in the chat there. Um, but we'll get through this one quick and then the next one here, we'll spend some more time on here. Okay, tummy aches. I want people participating here, if, uh, if you can, um, have you ever had uncomfortable, bizarre, weird sensations in your tummy? Okay. I want to see even just, yes, like how many of you guys, um, and try to think specifically of like when you experience these things. Okay. Um, I will definitely have Alex and Kristen participate in this one here uh, to kind of, for them to share their stories and I'm going to share a story uh, myself. Um, but yeah, we'll just throw it to the, to the audience here to be like, do you experience this? And what environments have you experienced this before? See lots of people agreeing in the chat. It <laughs> yeah. definitely does happen to them. Yeah, I'll um I'll share a story first, and then uh, maybe it can snowball um, from there. So when I was 25 years old, I was taking a vitamin, and the vitamin did not go down. The vitamin tried going down the right tube, but then it went down the wrong tube. And I had a really traumatic experience because there was a good 30 or 40 seconds there where I wasn't getting any breath in. Um, so I had a near death experience and it was obviously really horrible and really traumatic. And for a really long time, um, I had anxiety um, in my stomach and obviously in my throat as well, because that's kind of like where the trauma happened. But just at the sight of looking at something that would need to be swallowed, like, I don't know, food, which kept me alive, I would have like this horrible anxiety in my stomach. This is where the story just begins. Now, while I was while this happened, uh, I was working as a correctional officer, um, like on the units um, for between the ages of 25 and 31. 
And so after, you know, taking a month off to try to cool my jets from that experience, I went back to work and work is not a fun place to be. It's really stressful working in a prison. And so because my brain was already on high alert from having gone through that experience, I was even on more high alert than I typically was working at the prison. So my brain was sending me information all over the place. You know, even though, you know, fights weren't happening or I didn't, um, you know, there weren't people trying to, you know, beat me up. Uh, my brain was creating all of these scenarios because it was like, you're in danger, you're in danger, you're in danger, not safe, not safe. And then after a couple of months of doing that, I was having anxiety the, the night before at the thought of having to go to work. And then a few months later, the anxiety warped into, oh my goodness, if I don't sleep for more than six hours, I'm going to be tired at work, which is going to mean that my anxiety is going to be more difficult. So it started with a single moment in time, a freaking vitamin. And six months later, my brain had misread all of these other situations and environments where I didn't feel safe. And now the thought of going to bed late and not getting enough sleep brings me all the way back to this moment of the pill. The brain created all of these associations along the way. And so in my late 20s, I had to spend time in therapy unwinding all of those neural pathways that my brain had got confused. But the reason why I share that story is that the very first bit of information that I receive, if my brain is doing something on that bizarre continuum is, I get a really anxious feeling in my stomach. My brain is trying to tell me that there's something in my environment that is a threat to me. And I only ever, get those feelings in my gut. And that's the same for everyone I've worked with. Not safe lives in the gut. So that's the story that, that I wanted to share and, and hopefully um, maybe even some of you guys relate to kind of that system of how the brain does that. I can definitely relate to that. So I get a lot of the stomach aches or worry worries when mm -hmm. Um, I talk to colleagues in my field, so occupational therapy, who know so much, they know so much, and they're so experienced. Um, I get a strong sense of like imposter syndrome. Mm -hmm. So every time they talk about their knowledge, their experience, um, it's a threat to kind of my own validity and my own knowledge. And I think mm -hmm that I'm not as good of a, partic a practitioner. Um, so I get that sinking feeling in my stomach and I feel like I'm pretending. Mm -hmm. So I definitely know ways to manage that feeling and challenge those thoughts. Mm. But that automatic feeling of anxiety kind of started when I was already in grad school. Mm. So, you know, when you first enter the program, everyone's asking, oh, what did you study before? What's your experience? Like, what are your qualifications yes. to getting into this program, right? Yes. So at the time, I thought I was extremely lucky to get in. Uh, you forget about your past accomplishments and your contributions and things like that. Um, and then you just kind of compare yourself to other people. So yeah. that's where that feeling kind of started and has persisted mm -hmm. till even now, even though I have strategies in place to, to manage it. Yeah, because the brain's just doing brain things and trying mm -hmm. to look out for us. It's all right? automatic. It's yeah. all automatic, yeah. And even that saying you use, that sinking feeling in my stomach, um, I love like that saying because it describes the connection between the imposter syndrome that we probably feel more like in our chest and that sinking sensation of realizing we're not like safe. There's a threat. It's like a mm -hmm. connection between the two experiences, and that's where yes, okay, I did it right, the next slide is, is imposter syndrome, I'm not good enough, I'm a failure, I'm incompetent, I'm not worthy, that lives on our chest. So when Kristen was talking about that you know, sinking sensation, it's like, imagine literally their stress of like imposter syndrome, or like I'm not good enough or someone's gonna find me out, sinking to our gut, where our brain realizes we're not safe, we're not safe, we're not safe, someone's gonna find out about us. So it's like that connection essentially between those two points of contact where our brain sends us specific information of the not good enoughs in our chest and that sensation in our gut. Um, and I'll definitely ask Alex to, to share uh, some experiences with this because 
we're athletes. We felt this all of the time. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll leave this for Alex. Yeah, and I, when I think of the chest, it, it seems to be a very common one a lot of people also experience um, is that mm -hmm. tightness in the chest or the rapid heart rate. Yes. Um, you no, know, for me personally, uh, before big games, the chest would get really tight for me or before big exams. I don't know if any of you guys have ever done, felt that at school, um, but definitely there as well and the feelings of, oh no, you know, I'm not good enough or the, those thoughts tend to come in quickly after. So I know for me, it's the chest is a big indicator um, for me personally, but as well for like other clients. But like I said, it tends to hit, I would say like right before a big performance or presentation or exam that you need to do well on or pass. So I'm sure a lot of people can relate to that one. 100%. Um, and obviously the reason why I chose Mario here is because as gamers, if you didn't pull that clutch, if you had a really bad performance, what's the body language like? The body language tells us where we're experiencing the stress in our body. It's like we're protecting our sensitive heart, protecting that chest space where we're feeling really uncomfortable and we're sinking, you know, down and over it. Um, and, and so that's where you can really tell, like watching um, like esports and, and looking at guys in between rounds or, or after, uh, and they made a really poor decision in League of Legends and they, they got caught too far out and got completely destroyed. Like, what does their body language look like? Like when camera goes back on screen, um, and we're watching sports, like how are guys coming back to the bench or in between shifts or after an inning, like, are they caved forward? Are their shoulders forward? Well, guess what? They are struggling here going through these negative thoughts and feelings of like, you're an idiot. Like, how do you make them a mistake? What is wrong with you? You let the team down. Like, what? oh my God, so dumb. Like, that's what's happening when we feel like that kind of caving in sensation there. And again, everyone has experienced. This is by far the most common experience that that um, that we all have as humans. Um, so yeah, poor, poor Mario. You know, he just couldn't finish the level. Okay, there's, I'm not a linguistic. I, I've done a little bit of hermeneutics and, and studying certain texts before. Um, I am not someone who is well versed in sayings throughout human history, but I feel like this is one of the older ones. I mean, when you think of the image of the first image that comes to your mind, when you think of the weight of the world, it's probably Atlas. It's probably that statue of him literally carrying the weight of the world. And the reason why we've used that term for what seems like thousands of years is that when we feel that weight, that pressure of our life, maybe the lives of others, we feel it on our shoulders and on our upper back. We literally experience soreness there. I was working with a guy, um, such a great guy. He was, he was a mechanic and he had a new family, a new kid and a new position at work. And every single day, the very first thing that he would notice was his back and his shoulders were killing him every single day. And he came to my office first session and, and I was just kind of curious looking at it because it felt like, you know, they weren't, but it felt like his shoulders were like all the way up here from like how tight they were. And so I just asked him like, what's, are you like, so are you tight right now? He's like, yeah, like, I don't know why my shoulders are tight all the time. So, well, what are the, what's the first thing you think of? Like when you like put all of your focus and attention on your shoulders and he listed all those things at work, my wife, my new kid I was like, are, are you feeling a little too much that you're responsible or you didn't want to burden people right now? And his shoulders went <sighs> completely sunk down. This is important. Okay. The brain was sending a very specific message to his shoulders and his back, where we experience a sense of responsibility. As soon as he acknowledged that the brain was sending this message, the brain no longer sent the message. Message received. This is why this module is so critical. Why it's important that we specifically know why we're experiencing the sensation where we're experiencing and what it means. Is that once we realize, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm not feeling good enough right now. Okay, thanks, Brian. You're protecting me from like, you know, failing or looking stupid in front of people. But that wall, I'm okay. I accept you. Thank you for sending me this information. But I'm okay. I'm good enough. I'm ready for the next game. Okay. The brain has done its job. It sent the message. It no longer needs to continue to hammer away because we're not receiving it. 
So that moment where I saw that client literally just like, was like, okay. The brain's finally was like, finally, finally, he gets it. He understands what we've been trying to tell him this whole time. So now he knows anytime he experiences that sensation in his back or his shoulders, pauses, takes a deep breath to ground himself, and just says a few things to remind his brain that I'm okay. I have choices. I can control what I can. And I'm not responsible for the emotional well-being of all these people. They're responsible for how they respond. I'm responsible for my actions and my actions alone. He tells himself that and he moves on with his day. Doesn't need to worry about that, that sensation following him anymore. Have, has anyone here in the panel or anyone in the audience there experienced this before? That sense of don't want to be a burden or that sense of responsibility on shoulders and back? If so, don't feel shy to, uh, to share. The next one is going to be similar to some of the things that we've talked about, but this one is very, very specific to our voice. Um, there's a few people I know uh, in my life that when they get anxious, their anxiety lives in their throat because that type of anxiety is telling them it's not safe to speak or it's pointless. They're not going to listen to you anyway, helpless. You know, I will get ridiculed or criticized if I speak up. I will get made fun of. I will get belittled. And so literally imagine this energy, okay? Starting here, like, I'm going to speak. Nope, uh, nope, mm -mm. shut the valve. Nope. And it's like this pressure building here. All these things that you want to say, you want to express yourself. And, and that pressure feels like it's building up in the throat where it feels like your throat gets really small, almost where it's like it's hard to breathe. It's uncomfortable. It's because half of you is like, I need to say something. But then our dominant function default mode network brain is like, not safe. Don't do it. Don't speak it. You remember when you were seven years old? I know it's been 20 years, but remember when you were seven and you spoke up in front of class and didn't go so well? We don't want that happening again. That's the brain overprotecting. And that's a common experience that I've seen with people, um, especially in families too, large families where... Um, maybe there's a, a mother or father who's kind of like the, the dying, <laughs> say lots of head nods, like they are the emotional rhythm in the home, whatever they say goes and you just follow orders, do not question, don't share your opinion. Like we will experience anxiety here because we want to say something. We know that we have a right to, but our brain just knows it's not worth it and it's not safe. Shall I just leave the head nods to a unified agreement or is there opportunity for story time? We don't have to share. <laughs> no, I think this is a very relatable, like just culturally from my family as well. Mm -hmm. I think like Asian families tend to have that hierarchy where uh, the parents are always right. Don't talk back, just be mm -hmm. obedient, listen. And that's definitely affected my life forward and how I manage conflict. So once I have a disagreement mm -hmm. with someone, it's kind of like suck it up just deal with it. Um, yeah. And with the world being how it is now with all these things kind of happenings and lots of opinions being thrown around, I think there is um, lots of challenges in speaking up in what you believe and like what's right. Um, and yeah, that feeling of that throat being tight mm -hmm. and that you shouldn't stir the pot or mm -hmm. things like that. Very relevant for sure. Yeah, definitely. And I think this is spiraling off of what Kristen said. It, it's quite a common one. I think we've all experienced it to some degree. Uh, I know for me, it's, again, going back to like presentations and in school and it's like, oh, I have to stand up in front of the class by myself and do all this. And uh, I know sometimes, like I said, the it does tighten up and I find it often comes together with either the chest or what Kristen was saying, the sinking feeling. They're all kind of connected sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I find like the throat tends to start it off, especially for me, and then kind of move down. Mm -hmm. them. So you might notice a combination of a few happening in exactly. the same so. um, I do want to ask you another question about that, Alex, right away here. But um, when we go back to a few slides, I'll just actually move up here. 
right? where we talk about like, I'm anxious, I can't take anymore, I'm overwhelmed. This is when like we're getting a whole body experience, when we're not feeling safe, or we're feeling trapped, we're feeling helpless, when it's not safe to speak up, or we're feeling like not good enough. Our whole body is just radiating all this information. That's overwhelming. That's when, that's the right time to use overwhelmed. And so it literally like, it can be all connected, the throat, the chest, the gut, like it all kind of connects because we're experiencing all of those different threats at the same time. Um, I was curious with you, Alex, um, when you think back of your figure skating um, days and for any of you out there, figure skaters, gymnasts, um, some of these uh, environments where historically we know that uh, the coaches can be quite ruthless. Yeah. Um, when you think about those experience, um, do you experience any stress here, Alex, or is that, was that somewhere else? Uh, definitely the throat. There was no talking, I guess, back to coaches, uh, coaches mm -hmm. were always right. Yes. And I think that was just a culture of figure skating. And I know gymnasts, dance, a lot of those are all very similar, uh, with the culture of the sport and, uh, there was a lot of high expectations with performance. If we didn't perform, we didn't move on. And so I think that's where the chest and like the gut would come in for me. But the throat was like, I have to do what they tell me. There's no, there's no way around this. And it, um, I know I probably spoke up at some point and realized that it wasn't worth the fight yeah, probably yeah. is what happened. Um, <laughs> but I can't remember a specific time, but that's, uh, that's where I think it's kind of all related for me. Right. Like that, so. Okay. Yeah. Victor is asking as a question, if yeah. we think that schools and education systems should revise how they're structured, it seems like a, it's a potential cause of so many issues. <laughs> Do you have 10 hours? <laughs> Um, you cannot possibly create an environment like that where you've got 30 kids in a class where it's designed for each of the unique type of personalities in that space to feel comfortable, to feel safe. Um, and because of the complexity of all the different, you know, homes that people are bringing into those school environments, there's trauma in every single one of those classrooms and trying to manage that kind of environment. And teachers who are maybe having a tough day and, and are not as um, mindful or aware of some of the stress that their students are bringing in and how that might be affecting the group. Um, but the way that we have it designed, it, it's very difficult to manage a lot of these things. Um, and uh, and yeah, I mean, the very fact that almost every single client I've worked with has some traumatic memory of them, you know, speaking, you know, in front of their classmates when they weren't prepared or they um, they didn't want to do it. Why, why, why is that a thing? Why do we make people public speak? That's what, what's so stupid. Who decided that? We don't, it's okay. not a skill that, that all of us need to be like presenting in front of all these people. There's only a select few of us that will ever be in those kinds of positions. Mm -hmm. <laughs> or when the teacher just randomly calls on Yes. <laughs> oh, <laughs> the worst. Yeah. Cruel, almost cruel. Yeah. Straight up. Well, for me, like, I'd be like, mm -hmm, I'm coming. Like, I'd be really excited. But like, man, like, if you're more introverted, if, if you're more private, um, if you're someone who needs to plan before you, like, want to speak, which is probably the majority, you're probably falling within one of those three categories. Yeah. Randomly being chosen to speak in front of your peers. Bad idea. Not safe. Not good. So, yeah, I could speak for hours on that, Vic. So maybe we can. Um, create a time to have that that conversation uh, further. <laughs> okay, last slide, guys. Um, this just touches on what Vic just asked. Think of all of the classes, all of the 8 a.m. or 6 to 9 p.m. university courses that you had to take to graduate. Think about all the boring meetings um, that you've had to take part in, and your legs and your feet are just going a million mile a minute. We get that because it's a feeling of trapped. Boredom is an expression of trapped. Now, obviously, we can feel like trapped here. We, trapped can can be synonymous with not safe. And we might feel that in the gut. But like, if you're getting like this, like tapping feet, like I need to get the hell out of here. So if you're wondering like why you've got um, like so much energy in your legs, you know, you're probably someone, maybe you have ADHD 
and you just have that much energy all of the time. But if you're not one of those people, it's just your body being like, can we go? This is brutal. I, I'm just stuck and I'm bored and there's something more exciting I'd rather be doing. Um, and we can feel trapped that way. And obviously, like I said earlier, there are more extreme forms of trapped or like physically not safe and trapped that way. Um, but this is more kind of showing the humorous side of how our brain communicates stress to us sometimes where boredom can be an extension of like, I'm trapped and I need to get out. Um, so, so yeah, I just want to like end on a lighter note there. Uh, but yeah, this is somatic semantics. This is specifically how our bodies communicate with us. And I hope for those of you who, um, were able to tune in today that, uh, you were able to learn even just one thing about yourself, the one thing about your body that maybe you thought was random and, and, and now, um, there's some more certainty behind like why you experience the things that you do. Um, and so, yeah, that's all I've got for you. Um, from this panel and um, hope you enjoyed it. I have a lot of fun doing this. And uh, if there's any other questions, I guess we have a few minutes for that. Well, thank you so much, Matt and Alex. Like truly like your whole presentation was showing that there is like a universal language in our bodies that we need to decipher and decode to understand ourselves better and our emotions. Um, emotions really are complex and they are translated through the body. So definitely there are ways to improve that aspect of, of ourselves, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Alex and I are looking forward to being able to extrapolate even more on, on the emotional side and, and then module two, um, just as a, as a heads up, we're going to be speaking about, um, um, this is what Alex actually had spoken briefly about at Edmonton direct our the lies that we tell ourselves, the negative thoughts that uh, are an extension of these core beliefs. And uh, we'll be looking more extensively at those um, in our next module uh, in June. Looking forward to it. Yeah. Thanks for joining us today, everyone. And I just, again, to kind of summarize everything, usually the body is the first, I want to say like signs that we notice and then the thoughts typically come after. So um, like, like Matt has been saying this whole time is just really paying attention to the body and recognizing what it's trying to say. And then, like I said, typically the thoughts are not too far behind it. Um, or I like to call the rabbit hole starts to happen the spiral. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, so yeah, that'll be the next module, but yes, thanks for joining us today. It was fun. And we look forward to June. Right. <laughs> <laughs> we are at mind buffs we have an office in shirt park we see tons of people virtually online um our email is uh, info at mindbuffs.com you can send us a question whenever you want we love talking about this stuff and we love um, even more getting the opportunity to work with people one-on-one -on -one so that we can change these automatic processes because most of them are not necessary anymore they served a purpose, that purpose is over, it's time for the brain to adapt. And we can help you learn how to do that uh, in ways that are specific to your brain and your experiences. Um, but yeah, we at Mind Buff Series is what we do. We love to help people be able to get more out of their life by understanding themselves first and foremost and kind of building a foundation on that self-awareness. Perfect. I think they have a Twitter and an Instagram at Mind Buffs, if you want to reach them there. They're always posting good tidbits on Instagram, I've noticed, um, as well as their Twitter. Yeah. So thank you so much for tuning in, and we'll see you next month. Thanks, guys. Thanks.